Uh, as we begin this morning, one of the other things I did um, after marching band in high school, and I used to play drums for a season, is yeah, I think we're coming up on 30 years. 30 years ago, I enlisted in the U.S. Navy. <laughs> And uh, being in boot camp, or what the, the Navy boot camp is actually called basic training, uh, very interesting experience because you go from doing life as normal and then all of a sudden you're thrown into this new way of life and scenarios and, and schedules. Um, you, you spend hours upon hours in training each day and to become basically for boot camp for the military, for, for soldiers, to be a soldier now. You were a civilian before, now you're going to be a soldier for the Navy. You were a civilian, and now they have to make you into a sailor as you prepare to be on a ship. And a training, you know, you're training for a new way of life, new scenarios and situations. And when you go to basic training, there is a, 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 I wanted to say a gas chamber, but it's a way of learning what it's like if there's a gas attack or if there's smoke, you're learning to wear a mask and what that is like. There is a, um, a gun range where you're learning to shoot weapons. Swim training for the Navy, lots of classroom time, physical training, firefighting. You learn to fight fires because if there's a fire on the ship, you know, where else can you go? So you have to learn to fight off the fire. When you meet veterans, they have done some stuff. They know some things. In fact, if you go into a restaurant, you usually can pick out a veteran because they position themselves in the restaurant where they can see everything going on because there's situational awareness they're watching, you know, they have this, this way of doing life. One of the interesting things that we learned in the Navy that I'll never forget is something that uh, they call shoring. Um, you know, it is a way of holding up the walls or fighting off flooding. So on a ship or in a battle or a collision, there could be major damage that takes place to the hull. And it needs repairing, and you have to stop water from getting in. So if water gets inside the ship, the ship is going to sink. There's flooding and those things. So we have shoring to brace walls and um, different ways of plugging holes to stop the water. Ultimately, this process protects the ship, that it remains sound. It's a term we say, we want sound ships. We want it to have integrity. We don't want leaks. We don't want water to get into it. Ultimately, it means it is whole. It is a, a healthy ship. When ships approach storms, there's literally a call to batten down the hatches. I was on an aircraft carrier, and we went through storms where waves came over the flight deck. It is, it is huge, and so you, you're dealing with storms and water, so you batten down the hatches. You make sure they're tight. You do not want water to get into the ship. Years ago, an evangelist, D.L. Moody, said this, Christians should live in the world, but not be filled with it. A ship living in the water, or lives in the water, but if water gets into the ship, uh, she goes to the bottom. And so Christians may live in the world, but if the world gets into them, they sink. I've always looked at the church since coming into ministry and after being in the Navy as a ship, a vessel, a, a warship, and a rescue ship together. The Christians are part of this, this mission together. The ship is on mission in the world. The church is on mission in the world. And this mission comes with a message. And we've spent a lot of time in uh, 2 Timothy for, for several weeks and things that we've gotten into here and We'll be in 2 Timothy again this morning. Before we stand, I want to share a little bit about the Apostle Paul and Timothy here. So if you're, if you're new to Christianity, you can come in, and we've had people over the years who have come into the church, and you know, we say, turn to Thessalonians. You know, what does that mean? Thessalonians is a, a group of people in a city called Thessalonica, and so he writes to them, Ephesus, the Ephesians. Paul writes to Ephesus. There's Christians there in the city. He would write to the, the, the Nampaites today. Is it Nampians or Nampaites, whatever we would call that? That would, that would be how he would write it. Here, he's actually writing to a person. So Paul was a Pharisee who was actually warring against the church, and Jesus appears to him, and he gets saved, and, and God has this great mission for him to share the gospel with the Gentiles, those who are not Jews. So he's, he's gone through all these missionary journeys, and he is raising up young leaders and young missionaries, and one of them is named Timothy. 
And he is writing to Timothy to tell him what it means to be an elder in the church. And he's a young man. He tells him not to despise your youth, but to be an example to the believers. And so Timothy is timid at times, and Paul is encouraging him what's going to happen and how you're to live as a minister and how Christians should live and some of the scenarios you're going to face. And and that brings us to where we are, and he has more things to say about these, the eschatos, the end times, and things that we're going to see, and, and how we're to live, and what we're to uphold. So if you would stand this morning, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're finishing chapter 3, and we're going to get into a piece of chapter 4 here. So Paul writing Timothy, continuing from what we have already heard, While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. You think it's bad, it can get worse. Deceiving and being deceived. They deceive others, they themselves are deceived. But as for you, I love this. There's chaos in the world. There's going to be problems. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed We were praying and singing the things we believe this morning as a church, knowing from whom you've learned it. You've learned it from the Apostle Paul, the apostolic witness from Jesus Christ, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. You've been brought up in the church, if you have been, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And we've quoted this a lot together. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then we venture into chapter 4. I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Most ministers, when they say yes to the calling of God on their life, a charge will be preached to them to remember this charge, that we are saints of God and we have a mission, and a huge part of that mission is this next part that he's charging him. In the presence of God, because we will answer to God. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. That means sometimes things are bad. Attendance goes down. There's problems in the church when things are good, when in, in and out of season. Reprove, re- rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming where people will not endure sound doctrine. You are to preach the word, but a time is coming where people will not endure it. But having each itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They're going to turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We've talked about all kinds of myths today and the things that people believe. Again, as for you, always be sober-minded. Be serious-minded Christians. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill the ministry that God has called us to. Let's pray together this morning, church. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you again for this sacred moment in time. We celebrate you, God. You are the Holy One. You have saved us. You are working in our lives, and you have given us this great ministry, this great ministry and this mission that we need to fulfill. And I pray that we hear your words today, that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, that we receive the implanted word which is able to save our souls, that we are born again, that we can see, and Lord, that we live this out, that we become doers of the word. That, Lord, we do not leave today without any sort of conviction that whatever you speak to us as Christians, that we are obedient to it, that we don't avoid the hard things. Lord, you've called us to share the good news, to proclaim it, to be heralds of it. Let us be evangelists again. Let us invite people to you and to your great ministry and mission and to the church that people may be saved, that they may be equipped, Lord, that they may serve in this ministry as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Now, over the last two months, uh, we, have, we took a break from the Gospel of Luke, the series we've called the real Jesus, to deal with serious challenges that we're facing, not only in the culture, but also in the church. 
And we, we dealt first with our own character. How can I speak about issues unless I get my own character right? But we also spent time, um, you know, seeing what is taking place. And I've spoken to the reality that there is a great departure. I believe that we are in the apostasy, that there is a rebellion. Again, entire denominations have turned away from the truth of God, that we see the rise and triumph of the modern self. We dealt with this anti-God movement and the influencers that diminished Christ, that have a low view of Jesus And we saw this movement of darkness come through lies into the church. And last week we dealt with the harsh reality of the results. If you remove truth, lies come. If you remove light, darkness comes. If you remove life, death comes. And so we spoke about this culture of perversion and death. Again, we remove light, darkness. Remove life, death comes. And we obviously live in a dark world. You know, uh, you'll hear people from time to time say, we as a church, we're not to call out the darkness. We are to be the light, but it is both and. We are to call out which is evil and to speak to what is good. The world is in sin. They need to know that they're in sin. They need to be told the good news of Jesus, that they can be rescued. There is a big gaping hole in our culture. Uh, There is darkness, there is a void within people. They need to know who to come to. A lot of people have no clue. Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel distant? Why do I feel anxious and stressed? Why do I feel empty? We have the answer, we have the good news, and that is Jesus who's given us the promise of the Holy Spirit, and God comes to dwell within us. But there are things here for us as Christians, we have a great responsibility. And so what wise sayings that Paul have here? I mean, he's facing the end of his life. He will say that. We'll share this at the end of the message. He is finishing his course. He's preparing to depart. He has gone through some trials already. He's been in prison. He's written letters from prison. He knows that his death is impending. And so he's writing this this letter. And so what great wisdom does he have for young Timothy? And what does he say here? And this is what we need to see this morning, is that he needs to endure sound doctrine. Doctrine is just a fancy term for teachings. This is Christian teaching for us. And again, he says to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. They're going to have itchy ears. And not only, last week we talked about how false teachers will come, wolves from the outside in, wolves will be raised up from within to get followers behind them. Not only that, people that don't want to hear the message will gather speakers to fit what they want. I've always told people over the years that during the interim period, people are fasting and praying, and a lot of times churches want what they want and for what they want, and they want pastors to come in and make them feel comfortable. God actually brings a pastor to take you to a place that you would not normally go. Christians tend to settle where they are. And so our job and our duty as pastors is to take us closer to God. To put us in places of times that we can share the gospel and do the work and the ministry, it is a challenge, but that's why the pastors are here. The first thing that Paul wants us to see is that we are to preach the word, and that is for all believers. So Paul's writing Timothy, but these, in, in general, we are to be obedient to these things. We are all missionaries, if you will, so preach the word. It actually means to be a herald of it. Um, to proclaim it openly. I mean, we believe that God came in flesh, died on the cross for our sins, offers us eternal life, rose again and proved it. He calls us into this. He sends us into the world to say it, and we act like it didn't really happen. We are to herald it. We are to proclaim it uh, as a herald calling out people to be obedient to an authority is actually what it means. But people, there will be a time where they will not endure it. What does that mean, endure? It means to hold it up, to bear with. There's going to be a time where people don't hold it up anymore. They don't proclaim it. They don't bear with it. 
they'll go a, a certain distance with Jesus, they'll follow into ministry for a certain while, and then it becomes hard. This stuff is getting hard. And that's why Tim, uh, Paul tells Timothy, in season and out of season, there's times of great harvest, and there's times where we're not seeing a lot of people come to Christ, but we endure the Word. We keep preaching the Word of God. We are to endure it. Something else you'll see here, that we are to endure sound doctrine. The sound here you see on the screen means, again, like a ship. It is to have integrity. It is to be whole. It means healthy. We don't want holes in the doctrine. We don't want leaks. I don't believe in leaky doctrine. I believe we should preach what's been preached for 2,000 years. We don't want leaks getting in because it causes the doctrine to fail. Paul is telling the people, uh, telling us that people will not endure it. And he means people of the faith. He's not talking about the world. The world doesn't believe already. He's talking about within Christianity, within the faith. That's why he says at the end of the passage here, I have kept the faith. Others will not keep the faith. It will be a challenge for them in Christianity. We must endure it all the more today. Because it is easy to say, I am a Christian in our culture, but deny the truth that's been passed down for 2,000 years. We must endure the message. This, and this is the thing. This is our message. It is Jesus and his teachings. We get Christ. We get his church, the fellowship of the saints. We love the saints, by the way. I, I do not believe what people say today. I love Jesus. I just don't like church. I love Christ, and I love the family of God. I love his people. And sometimes the people are problematic, and that's fine. Sometimes I'm problematic. I want you to still love me through my problems. I still love God's people through their problems. We love Christ. We love the church. We love the teaching because it is truth. It is spiritual. It comes from heaven. It is heavenly doctrine. It is the message that saves the soul. As soon as the, the, the pulpit and the word of God is corrupted, people aren't able to be saved because they don't hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need today. We need to uphold the doctrine. Now, there's a part of ministry where we need to adapt to win people, uh, new methods. Things are always changing in the world. There's new ways of doing ministry. However, orthodox Christianity, and when we say orthodox, it means right or true, uh, established or approved doctrine. What we believe as Christians is established and it's approved and it's been passed down for 2,000 years. Throughout history, they never, they never at once gathered to say, how can we change the message to make it more appeasing or you know, palpable? They, they, they never did that. There's not one council that says, you know, we got together, we were trying to figure out how we can really change this to approve sin and make it easier on people. The councils throughout history gathered to defend this doctrine that we have today and actually to help us have what we have in the scriptures, the canonization of the scriptures. If anything, the church has met throughout history to defend and maintain what's been passed down. I think we should meet and come up with plans and strategies. How can we win our community better? How can we reach the lost? But it is never, how can we change the message? And what has happened in modern culture, people have tried so hard to make it more relevant that they've made it irrelevant. Anytime I try to change it, where's the power in that? If God needed it changing, he would change it. But it says in the word, my word is forever established in heaven. It is the power of God that saves. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Christ. We need the true doctrine of Jesus today. What are those true doctrines? We were singing some of that today. Trinitarian theology is historical Christian doctrine. That Jesus is the Son of God. The spirit of Antichrist denies those things. That he literally, historically, died on the cross was buried, rose three days later, was resurrected, that he ascended, that he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will be coming again. There will be a judgment that there is a church. One of the things that is Christian doctrine is that we are saved by grace and not by works. You cannot earn salvation. It is a gift given to you. 
If you've been struggling in sin and you're wondering, what can I do? There's nothing you can do other than believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has done this for you, that he died for your sins. He gives you the gift of eternal life, and that's pretty awesome. All the other religions of the world will make you go through a list of things you have to do to be saved. Christ has given us salvation. It is a gift. Historical doctrine is also that there is a changed life, that we are a holy people, and that there will be an eternal reward, if you will. There will be an eternal separation. Either we will be with Christ for all of eternity, or people will be departed from Christ. One of the things that Paul writes the church in Thessalonica So then, brothers, you see on the screen, stand firm and hold to the traditions that were taught by us, either by our spoken word we came to preach or to teach you in person or by the letters that we sent around. I like what one of my professors says. He says, any description of what it means to follow Jesus that is not consistent with the apostolic witness and the church's historical affirmations is a creation of human imagination. Anything that people present to you today that is different than what has been passed down by Christ and his apostles is human imagination. It's just, it's been made up. So we preach the truth. We stand firm on the truth. We live this truth. We defend this truth. This truth is what saves people. The next thing that Paul wants us to see this morning, church, is that we are equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 All scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. Here at the end, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, that we are equipped for every good work. We are to endure doctrine. We are to be equipped. So why is the scripture important for us? Why do we defend this and teach this? Why is this the the center at times? Christ is the center person, but there is a message from Christ. Why is this important for us? Because it trains us in how we live as Christians. We learn about Jesus, and then we're like, well, how do we follow him? The scriptures teach us on how we're to live a Christian life. And he goes on to say that we may be complete, fitted for every good work, that we are developed into a way that we can live as Christians, that we're growing, that we're severing away from the old life, and we're living in the new life of Jesus Christ. And our job as pastors is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. A huge portion of this Uh, When you say yes to ministry in the Church of the Nazarene, in the manual, they have the pastor's role laid out in there, and it's way too extensive. Um, I would love it to say the pastor preaches, he prays, he pastors the people, he helps the poor, and he develops and makes disciples. I wish it just had those few things in there, but it keeps growing and growing. Ultimately, our job is to equip the saints for the work of of ministry. I want you to see that this morning here. Paul says this to the church in Ephesus. So ultimately, equipping is you're saved, you are to know the scriptures, you are to be sanctified, and you are to serve. So Paul says this, Ephesians chapter 4, and he gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the pastors, the pastor teachers. Why did he give those? And by the way, pastors, servants in the church are gifts of God to the church. God has given them. In our culture, they are mocked, they are put down, they are gifts to the church. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body, so that we may no longer be tossed around. Why did we hit these hard subjects? Because the church in modern days is tossed around. Um, tossed to and fro by the waves that are carried about in every wind of new doctrine. They get into the ship and the ships begin to sink. We don't want people carried away by false doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful seams. We want people to stand on the firm foundation of who Jesus is, to know the truth. We want people equipped. There was a woman in Raleigh years ago that she was in a walker and at times in a wheelchair. And, and when we gave the testimony times, uh, they'd pass the mic to her and, and she would they'd say, what is, what is the testimony? What do, you, what do you want to share? She would say, I'm too stressed. She said, I'm too blessed to be stressed, too anointed to be disappointed, and too equipped to be whipped. So she never felt that she was whipped by the evil one, she was equipped and ready to live as a Christian, as God had called her to live. God wants us to be fully equipped today. 
that we are the servants, the mature believers God has called us to be, um, that we are to do what he's called us to do, to live in unity, to serve, that we're built up in love. When we are serving together, when we're pulling in the same direction, it builds camaraderie, it builds the sense of love in the community, and so when we're serving together, it builds that unity together so we're not tossed around easily. We're looking out for one another. Um, I have thought of the church, again, like a rescue warship. We're fighting, but we're also rescuing at the same time. And one of the things I like to remind God's people is that rescued people are equipped so they can participate in the rescue mission. We don't want stragglers just coming and going. We want people to believe that you're, you're following, you're being equipped to serve, that God gives everyone gifts to be able to serve in the church. I was on an aircraft carrier, a huge ship, and it, was all, it would also rescue people. It was part of a rescue mission. It was a warship, but it was also a rescue ship. And on a ship, and this had 5,500 people on it when all of the air crew and the, the jets were on the aircraft carrier, and out of all these departments, every department mattered. I mean, it is created as a portable uh, you know, air base that is mobile on the water to go and be anywhere in the world. And for that, it meant, it meant having jets on board. And if it had jets, it had um, uh, pilots. And if it had pilots, it needed people to tend to the pilots and to the jets. And so we had departments. There's people all over the ship. There needed to be a department to feed the crew. There needed to be a department when there are injuries to take care of people when they are injured. I ended up being in supply department, which we supplied everything throughout the ship, whatever anyone needed, a part for a jet or supplies from toilet paper to, to parts on jets. We were a part of all of that. Every department mattered to function in the ministry or the mission on the ship here. It all matters. Paul says this in Ephesians 4.16, in the context of equipping the saints, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped is joined together. When each part is working properly, when each department is working and doing what it's supposed to do, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When we are functioning the way we we're supposed to function, when we are working together on the same mission, the rescue mission to win people to Jesus, then we are built up in love and the church grows naturally. Being under good biblical teaching um, radically changes your life. When God changed my life in 2003, one of the radical things that he did is I was awakened to the word of God. I was always reading the Bible from time to time, but now I had spiritual eyes. I was alive to it, and I began to grow, and we fell in love with Christ and his church and the word of God, and we began to see these stragglers that were in this little Bible study. They began to grow, but the word of God was center of that that we believe it, and that we are changed by it. The next thing I want you to see this morning, church, is that Paul tells us that we are to do the work of an evangelist. 2 Timothy 4, 5, As for you, always be sober-minded, be a serious-minded believer. Don't be caught up in the things of the world. Endure suffering. There's going to be problems in ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now, I would ask before we get into this, Whatever God has called you to do, do you feel like you are fulfilling it? And if you can't answer that that well, there's room to grow. You recognize, wow, I don't know that I'm fulfilling what God has called me to do, and I want to grow into that. I want to learn. I want to develop. But here it is. The word evangelist means bringer of good tidings. At Christmas, we sing good tidings we bring for you and your kin. We bring good tidings to the world. The good news of Jesus Christ, and though the world is in darkness and death and sin, God has offered life and eternal life. This is good news, that we can be rescued from a life of sin, that we can have relationship with our Heavenly Father, that we can have eternal life, and we get called into this great mission that God has called us to. Now, we may not all be called to be pastors and preachers and teachers, but we are all supposed to be reachers. 
And I believe that God, through his sovereign hand, has positioned and gifted every single person and believer to place you where you are that you may tell people about Jesus and give glory and honor to God. That you represent him wherever you are. If it's in the school, as a teacher, whatever it is, you're praying. You're praying for your students. If it's at work, a co-worker. We all have co-workers. Their lives are messed up. They need someone to speak truth and love into their life. That we're there to pray for them. And I believe if you begin to say, you know what, I can pray for you, it opens the door for more. Hey, man, I heard what you were talking about. Can I pray for you? And by the way, your co-workers should know that you're saved. It shouldn't be at your funeral that they show up and like, he was a Christian? I, I never knew that. Your, by the way, your family should know that you're a Christian too, but your coworkers need to know that you are a believer. We are the bringers of good news. Now, there's a part of making disciples um, that is, you know, there's, there's some hard stuff. I've, God started calling me years ago, and I just wanted to get the good news out, invite people to Jesus, invite them to church, and there's going to be failure along the way. Not everyone you share the good news with is going to come along and follow Jesus. The apostle Paul, this great missionary, would go to new cities. He would preach. Some would mock him. At times, they attacked him. Sometimes he's thrown in jail. But it would say that there were some who believed, and those are the ones he gathered together to be a part of the church. So at some time, you're going to share with people, and they're going to deny it. They're going to reject it. There's some people who are thinking about it, so we continue to pray for them. We continue to share the good news. We bring the good news to them, and when they believe, we make them a part of the church, and we equip them. We're building them up in the faith. A few things about evangelism. We are all called to do it. It is time to get outside of our comfort zone. If you're not a talker or a conversational person, at least you could do is start praying for someone around you and allow God to open doors. And you should pray for God to open doors and looking for opportunities. Um, that you should know your neighbor's names, know your coworkers' names, be the person that brings life and love and something good into the environment at work. I worked at the post office. People rarely came to work smiling. And I would bring donuts, and it would change the mood from time to time. Bring donuts into the break room, say blessings or something on it, whatever. But be, know your coworkers, know your neighbors' names. Build relationships. What has happened is that we are highly relational on uh, social media, but we're not relational in person. We need to be that again, be in good relationships with people. Lead conversations to Jesus. Don't just have common conversations on the phone or at work. Try to lead the conversation toward Jesus to open the door about church. One way or another, guys, when they talk, they're like, hey, man, what do you do? What do you do? They're always going to ask that. Ladies don't typically ask, hey, what do you do? Guys are always going to ask. So when it comes to me, they're going to say, what do you do? Or why did you move to Idaho? Well, I'm a pastor. Oh, really? You'll find out real quick if they're like, okay, whatever. You know, you're like, well, this guy needs Jesus. We're going we're gonna to lean in. Or it's like, oh, which church? You know, and you can have this conversation. Or somebody will say, you know, I used to go to church. We need to bring those people along too, but have the conversation. Lead into church or Jesus. Share the gospel. Don't be afraid of it. The Bible tells us it is the power of God. The power has never been in the messenger. The power has always been in the message, and I have failed time and time again trying to share it. And the time where I thought I did the best in preaching and teaching, nothing happens. When I did the worst, God moved mightily, and it is awesome. So we share even in our failures. We need to invite people to Christ and church on a regular basis. And what does he say here? He says, do the work. It is work. It is work to stay after people. It is work to do ministry. It is work to care about people. It is work to get involved in people's drama. Everybody today posts stuff about, they're so toxic, and I can't be involved with them anymore. Everybody is toxic. Everybody has problems, and we need to get involved and have conversations. Everybody I've ever talked to, they have a family member that's done this or that, and they hurt me, and I'm not talking to them, and I, I don't care. Talk to some people, build some relationships, reach out, get involved in the drama, pray for people along the way, love people. That's what we're called to do, to intercept drama and problems, bring the gospel and the good news with patience and teaching and love, in which Paul says for us today. We are doing the work of evangelism. We are heralds of the good news. 
We want people to believe the good news. And guess what happens? When one believes and one comes, then they share more of the gospel. What has happened in modern Christianity is that we become very comfortable. And the longer that you have been in church, and I know the statistic hurts, the least likely you are to invite someone to church. It is the new believers that have been rescued from sin or been invited and believed in Jesus. They're excited about that. They're passionate about this Jesus that saved me, that delivered me. And they bring a friend, and that friend brings a friend. We need to be like that again. We need to recognize that Jesus Christ has saved us. We need to tell people about it. They need the answer. The world is in problem, has problems. It is in darkness. It is in sin. It is in death. And they need the good news of Jesus, the gospel, the healing, the forgiveness, and everything that comes with that. Why? Why all of this? Eternity is on the line. I'm going to ask our praise team to come to the platform at this time. And just a few more thoughts here. Eternity is on the line. Paul says this, 2 Timothy 4.1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. This is all in the, the context of who God is, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, eternity is on the line. We are to look forward to the appearing of Jesus Christ. I was just listening uh, about that on the way to church this morning. There's a measure of we're excited about it. I want Christ to return. At the same time, we're still here and we're sharing the good news and we want people to be saved. But Christ is going to judge. Judgment is real. There's two judgments that are going to take place. One is judging of the living, that is the believer. Every believer, you're saved, you make it to heaven, but you're going to face Jesus and we will be judged as a Christian. Did you use your gift? Did you fulfill your ministry? Did you live according to the way you said you would live and according in the view of who Christ is? There's another judgment, and it is the judgment of the dead. This is why we are here. We want to see people rescued. Those who do not believe, those who have mocked, those who are in rebellion, um, they will face God at the great white throne judgment. And they will be told to depart be another departure we don't want people to be told to depart from God we want them to come into the family of God we want them to be saved this final thought here church Paul says this here he is he's writing it's the end of his life I'm already being poured out as a drink offering on the old altars they would put animals on that as sacrifices there was a drink offering they would throw liquid on the altar and go up in smoke I have offered myself as a drink offering the time of my departure has come he's at the end of his ministry here I have fought the good fight I have finished my course I kept the faith I endured the doctrine I equipped the saints I evangelized everyone that I could henceforth there is laid up for me this crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So as we close church, we're going to offer another time of prayer. And the question is just this. Do you love him? Would you come and pray and just declare your love to Christ again? This is for all who love his appearing. Let's stand, let's worship, let's pray together this morning.